Wow, Thursday at 5 p.m. You guys are hardcore. <laughs> so at this point, you're probably all uh, jQuery out. You're ready to go home. So I promise I will keep it short and brief so we can get you guys out a few minutes early. So a few shameless plugs before I get started. Um, if any of you are no developers, we have a conference at PayPal. If you happen to be in San Jose on Friday, February 28th, you know, give it a give us a visit, and just to plug the framework that I'm presenting on, Kraken JS. I know all of you are probably checking email, Facebook, whatnot. If you want to get distracted, check out the website. See if anybody can find the Easter eggs we have on it during this presentation. Just give us a shout. All right, let me get started with this. So PayPal, two years ago, it was a horrible place for a developer to work in. We were stuck in Waterfall. We Thankfully, in 2012, we actually stopped using Waterfall. You know, this very lengthy process where you're in development for a long time, and by the time you're done, your product's already obsolete, right? We stopped Waterfall. We switched over to Agile using Lean UX. And, you know, Lean UX, we basically went to quick iterations. We had people go on a whiteboard, draw a concept. Developers would try to quickly create a prototype. We would show it to a user, get their feedback, and start the cycle all over. So it was a step in the right direction, right? We were starting to embrace all the right technologies, but in the wrong way. For example, we were using CSS, JavaScript, and templating, which is all very good and proper. The problem is that all of this was written in Java. If you can believe it, our CSS was done in Java, our JavaScript was done in Java, even our templates were JSPs. It was this horrible, convoluted way to, to work. Everything was very tightly coupled. It made hard, life hard for the design teams, for developers. Kind of sucked. So the first step is we got rid of this guy, right? Uh, oh, and like I said, this is kind of like, uh, Slapping this ugly wing on a beautiful car. If you use the right technologies in the wrong way, bad things happen. So, step one, get rid of Duke. We replace JSPs with Dust uh, JS templating. So, bye bye to this guy. And second step, we started using Node for mock applications. When we needed to prototype stuff, we switch over from this horrible stack and we played with Node. You know, we found that developers could very quickly get things up and going. Uh, how quick was the process? Well, it was really fast. Uh, we have this story at PayPal when we started switching to the new stack. Are you guys familiar with um, EDI, or Executive Driven Innovation? <laughs> yeah, right. so a couple of hands out there. So this is when you need to design something and some high-level executive comes down and tells you exactly what your project needs to look like, how it should work, you know, just messes with your whole workflow. So we had this product we were working on and EDI comes along, right? Um, senior executive comes along, he starts drawing on the whiteboard, we get, start going back and forth with ideas. And during this time, we have a couple of um, UI guys quietly typing away at their laptops. So after um, quite a few minutes of this back and forth, um, they, the exec says, okay, perfect. This is what the project needs to look like. When can you guys deliver this? The UI guys turn the laptop around and show them the project being done. That's how fast uh, the new stack was. It just allowed people to spin up things very quickly. So at some point, somebody asked, what if? Right, so what if we take this little prototype stack and we move it to production? Hmm. Well, as usual, as soon as we said that, we started coming across all the usual objections, right? No JS, JavaScript, what are you talking about? This is not an enterprise language, you know, it's this little toy thing. It's not scalable, it's not secure, it's slow, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. So the question became, well, we really wanted to use this because we saw the advantage of this stack. So how do we sneak it into PayPal? Well, we basically pulled a Trojan horse on them, right? We asked the, the executive team to do a quick pilot project and that's how the Kraken was born. 
So the objective of the Kraken project was twofold. Um, number one, of course, bring Node into PayPal. But the main thing was to free up our developers. Right? You guys saw this horrible stack that we were, wor were working in. With Kraken, we were going to be able to just rip this thing out and basically step into the 20th 21st century, you know, start using something more modern, uh, more standardized than this thing that nobody in the world knew how to use. So we go with pilots, right? If you need to bring something into your company, let's say you want to pitch no to your senior team, the approach that worked for us was um, a pilot. Right? A pilot is harmless. Hey, just let us play with this little side project, see how it goes. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Right. We identified a project at PayPal that was already ongoing in Java, and we asked uh, senior leadership, hey, can you give us a couple of resources so we can try to redo this thing in Node and, and you know, see how they stack up against each other? They said, okay, what's the harm? So we went to work. Our timeline. In January, we, we found the project that we wanted to emulate in Node. We started working on it, but we very quickly realized we didn't have an infrastructure at PayPal to work with Node. The way that uh, PayPal applications work, we have our backend services, which are all written in C++, Java, whatnot. And then we have the mid-tier services that need to interact with the backend. This application was one of this, uh, these mid-tier applications. It didn't have any way of talking to the backend services, so we had to build, we had to build this infrastructure for Node to talk to the old legacy services. That took about two months of work. In March, the infrastructure was ready, and this is when we could actually get started on the project we wanted to. So our developers went to work, and by June, not only had they um, caught up to the Java project, they had actually surpassed it. And it was funny because the, the Java guys actually saw this and they started saying, hey, can we go over and work with the, those Node guys? They seem to be doing really well. So let me share a few stats about the, the two projects. And remember, this is the exact same project done in Java and in Node. Lines of code. Node 7400 versus 18,000 in Java. Files. 84 versus 255. And this is actually one of my favorite stats for this project. Comments, 626 versus 10,000 in Java. So when you look at all of this together, it tells me that the, um, the node code base was much more compact, easier to read, easier to maintain. It took less people, uh, less time to do the same amount of work than the Java guys and the results were just nicer to look at. And, oh, and the final stat, because a lot of people ask me this, um, number of developers. We had two people working on the Node stack versus 12 people working on the Java stack. And those two guys went so much faster than the Java ones. And this is really not a, a reflection on Java or Node as a programming language. Um, I've given this presentation before, and it sometimes degrades into a discussion of what language is better. This is a reflection of um, which language was a more useful tool for PayPal, given our technology stack. So in this test, we did an apples to apples comparison and we proved that Node worked at PayPal. So the executive team said, hey, that's awesome. Go ahead, work with it. But well, turns out that it wasn't that easy, right? PayPal is a very large company. We have about 4,000 devs, give or take, and we needed to support them. The problem here is that if you give the same problem to 10 people in the Node ecosystem, they're going to solve it in 10 completely different ways, right? The existing frameworks were not enough for us. Another problem that we had at PayPal was um, internationalization. We needed to support a lot of countries, a lot of languages, for many, many subtle um, variations. So whatever solution we came up with needed to address this problem as well. So we come back to the Kraken. And if any of you are checking out the website, if not, you should, 
you'll notice that we have a different logo. This is the uh, what we call the Angry Kraken. This is pre-release. When we went to the new website, the design team came up with uh, the Happy Kraken, which is supposed to be more user-friendly, but I like this guy, so I keep him around in my presentations. So anyhow, what is this Kraken thing? Well, the Kraken suite is actually a, a set of modules that all lay on top of Express. Right? We didn't want to hide Express from the developers. We just wanted to give it some convention and some configuration and syntactic sugar. So Kraken.js is the actual framework, if I want to call it that. It has a Yeoman generator. And I'll go into detail on each of these. I'm just doing a quick overview. It has an application security module, which was something very important at PayPal. We wanted to make sure that any application that shipped had app, uh, security configured out of the box. We didn't want to count on developers remembering to turn some things on. So we made it part of the framework. Makara was support for internationalization. And finally, Kappa, it's a um, cool toy that we had internally. It's an NPM proxy, which allowed us to have our own private NPM repo within the company. So let me go into details into each of this. So the framework, first of all. What do we need in a framework at PayPal? Again, if you look at what exists in the Node ecosystem right now, you have two extremes. You have uh, the loose frameworks, kind of like Express. You know, it's very nice, very easy to use. But if, again, if you give one problem to three teams, they're going to solve it in three different ways. We wanted to build a framework that was a little bit more solid than that. But we wanted to avoid mistakes of the past where you over-engineer it and you create this horrible, rigid thing that doesn't give uh, developers any freedom to, them to create their stuff. So we needed to hit that little Goldilocks framework where it was not too simple, not too complicated. It just has to give you the right foundation for your project and then just gets out of the way and lets you do your thing. So what's a Kraken? Well, it's our homegrown Node.js framework with support for globalization, security, and configuration. Those were the main problems that we needed to address. And we're, we built this thing using all open source components. This is one big change from PayPal two years ago, where we kind of tried to customize and PayPalize everything. With this framework, we very consciously wanted to keep it, um, we wanted to do the same thing everybody else was doing, right? So we don't have our own mystery framework that you have to waste time training people when you hire them. What does it look like? Well, we have um, configuration as external files. Uh, if you guys use Express, you know that a lot of times you hard code your configuration into it. At PayPal, we needed to deal with a lot of different environments. We have development, we have production, we have QA. So this allowed us to separate the configuration from the code. If, for example, you're a developer, you're working on your local machine, you want to use port 8080, you want to use some weird path for your views, when it's time to switch it to production, you actually control this externally. You set an environment variable, node env, set it to production, and the framework is automatically going to pick up the right configuration file. Instead of picking app-development, it would pick app.json, which has port 80 and a different path for the views. This sped up development a little bit, and you know it keeps it nice because you don't have to touch the code when you switch environments. You just deploy, and the framework just configures itself for the right environments it's running on. Configuration. We uh, made some names auto-wired. Let's say, for example, index, right, your home page. You have a controller, you have a template, and you have a content bundle. And they all follow the same naming scheme. The advantage of this, in this example, it's super simple, right? It's only one file. But what happens when your project expands? You don't have only one route. You're going to have 25 routes. Let's say you get somebody new into the team, and you tell them, hey, new guy, go fix the user profile controller, blah, blah, blah. Well, this person's going to very easily come into the project without knowing anything. He's going to look at the structure, and he can very quickly find what it is that he needs to fix. 
So having these naming conventions make your projects more maintainable and it allows people to come in into your team and very quickly get up to speed. That was one of our main concerns here. You know, large company, we switch people between different teams. They needed to be able to very quickly ramp up. Couple of configuration hooks. Um, I'm actually gonna skip this slide just to get you guys out of here early. But essentially, it gives you freedom to configure Kraken, um, to add any additional middleware that you want to use, any extra configuration steps in a very clear and defined manner. Generator. The generator is one of the cool pieces of this suite. This is very similar to um, Rails for Ruby. It lets you create scaffolding very quickly with a few commands. When we started this, we had an application that people cloned all the time, but that wasn't a very good approach. You wanted to create your own thing from scratch. So we built a Yeoman generator, and to create a basic application, you just need to install this thing, type Yo Kraken, you fill in a few prompts, and that's it. It will generate applications, pages, controllers, the, the bundles, it'll even do tests for you. And the whole goal of this is to speed up application and to make sure that any <clears throat> application remains consistent. Since you use the, this generator, it's going to create all the, the stops for you. So it kind of becomes a fill in the blanks game. It simplifies application development at PayPal. Ah, security, Luska. One of the big concerns is that we want to keep our application secure. We did this through middleware. Right, Luska enables all of these nice headers, completely transparent to the user and out of the box. <clears throat> so an application created with Kraken is gonna be secure against uh, click jacking. If somebody wants to load your application within a frame, it's not gonna be able to. If you want to implement cross-site request forgery, it's there and all of these nice things. These are um, configurable, so if you don't need one of these things, you can turn it off, but the default is that it ships with these settings on. We think they're smart defaults, which is why we included this in the framework. Internationalization. This is one of the nicest features of Kraken. If you've ever had to support multiple languages, you know it's a pain in the neck. Right, you need to start sprinkling logic in your templates, you need to create all these weird cases, you need to figure out how are you gonna store all the different string, strings. This solved this problem for us completely. It let us separate <clears throat> the templates and the content that gets merged with those templates, and we can actually pick different content bundles on the fly. So you can have a content bundle for English, one content bundle for Spanish, and this thing will get merged at runtime. So, quick example, let's say you have um, English and French Canadian. This is one of those things that if you blink, you miss it. It lets you do things like uh, drop downs. Let's say you register a user in a different country. You don't need to spend a lot of time modifying your template to account for different states. You make it a part of this external properties file and things will magically get rendered at runtime based on where this request is coming from. Kappa, I didn't have a nice picture for this, so you get my dog on a hiking trip. So it's an NPM server, it's a, it's a proxy for an NPM server. Why did we need this? Well, let's say that you're a large company and you need to create your own modules for internal deployment but you don't want to host these modules on the public NPM registry because you know it's your company's secret sauce. Well, you had to host your own internal NPM server. But then what do you do with when you need external stuff? Do you replicate the whole thing internally? Do you publish your stuff out there? Well, this allowed us to do um, an internal registry where we only host our private modules and everything else gets fetched from the external registry. It let us do some nice tricks, like blacklisting certain modules that we knew we didn't want to use. This actually prevents developers from installing these things. If you have concerns about license, let's say some rogue developer within your team installs a module that's AGPL license, you know, that spells trouble for you. If you install AGPL, it means that you technically need to open source whatever you installed it in. 
thus you reveal the company's secrets. Well, having these license checks in the proxy helps prevent that type of thing. And finally, you don't need to replicate the whole external thing. So let's say you have a project that uses Express and your own private module. When you, when you do NPM install, this thing is going to try to fetch Express. It's going to look for it in your internal registry. If it doesn't find it, it's going to go fetch it externally. Next up, when you try to get your private module, it's going to look for it internally. It will find it there. And that's it. You're done. So you have a very nice separation of things. A couple of best practices that we found. This may not be applicable to everybody, but I just wanted to share some problems that we had at PayPal when we made the switch over to Node. Well, one is custom infrastructure, right? We all have some, but you should try to avoid it if possible. Um, use standards in your project. Quick example for logging. When we started, people were using this weird uh, logger thing, and, client, and they had this client logger, which was emulating stuff that we had done before in the Java world. We had to train teams to actually use standards. You know, for example, request has facilities for logging, for timing things. Uh, same thing for sessions. We were not using the standards. We had our own custom session manager. We wanted to get away from custom stuff in, and go into standards. And one big point was this culture clash we had at PayPal. Right? This was probably the, the biggest cultural change that going with an, an open source type project brought to the company. The first was the, the not written here syndrome. Hey, we're a technology company. We have developers. We can write whatever tool we need internally. It's such a great idea. Uh, no, not really. If you write your own stuff, you have a couple of problems. The first one is that versions don't usually evolve, right? You have some smart guy that sits down, he writes it, but what happens when this smart person leaves the company? You get stuck with this tool that nobody knows how to maintain. It's not standardized. People need to spend weeks trying to understand it. And you're missing out on the collective knowledge from the community. If you use an open source tool, that's always going to be evolving. If you do your own thing, well, you're stuck with it pretty much. And finally, uh, the exposure of sacred code. When we started uh, using Kraken, we actually bought an enterprise license from GitHub. So within PayPal, we have our own GitHub instance. One of the biggest changes was were that people were not sharing their code. We were using Git, but nobody knew who was working on what. People had their own repos stashed away in mystery computers. When we did the move to GitHub, collaboration in the company just went up by an order of magnitude. Everybody could see the code from other people, and it was beneficial all around. And this was actually driven by our project. We started pushing people towards GitHub. It helped immensely. A couple of hiccups along the way. Well, again, kind of specific to PayPal, but I wanted to share these. Um, we were basically a Java shop, Java C++ shop. So a lot of developers had a, um, a learning curve going into from what they knew about JavaScript. It had mostly been front-end JavaScript. When you go to the server, there are some things like globals that don't work too well. So we had to retrain people into thinking for the backend. SSL resumption was probably a very PayPal-specific problem. Internally, when one of our services talks to another, that connection is encrypted. The problem that we had is that the encryption um, did not sustain. So whenever a, a new call had to be made, the service needed to do a full SSL handshake. It was kind of wasting time. We, when we finally solved this problem, we went from 25 milliseconds per request down to four milliseconds per request. So it helped boost our internal efficiency a lot. Yeah. Not applicable to everybody, just sharing some hiccups that we had as a large company adopting Node. And a couple of best practices that we found uh, for scaling and monitoring. We're using PM2 for management at PayPal. Um, it helps with clustering and load balancing. And we found that Node likes to live in its own core. You don't get a lot of benefit from giving a lot of horsepower to a single node process. So when we scale it, we give it one or two, um, I'm sorry, one node process per core, and we do virtual machines with one or two cores. 
This way it's very easy to spin up new node processes, take them down, restart them. It seems to run very happily in this fashion. Where's PayPal today? Well, it's a brand new day at the company. We have, this is actually outdated. We are now up to 20 Node.js applications. Um, it was mandated that this year, any new development was gonna be done in Node. So PayPal is doing a major shift to this technology stack. If you go to PayPal right now, check out activity and the homepage you see when you log in, those are all being served out of Node applications. And one of the best changes is that we finally established boundaries between UI, logic, and services. Beforehand, all the layers were kind of reaching into each other. It was a tangled mess. Now development can go a lot faster. It used to be that it took about six weeks to make one change in one character in the home page because of the way that things were tangled up and deployed. Now changes take a couple of days only because we need to get approval. Still not perfect, but way better than what we had before. And finally, open source software. For the first time, PayPal is seriously contributing to the open source universe. We started with the Kraken project, and since, um, if you guys visit the engineering blog at PayPal, you'll see all the different things that we're putting out there. We're doing plugins for accessibility at Bootstrap, we're contributing to cloud software, um, OpenStack, we're hosting the conference at Node.js. We're just very actively trying to give back to the community because once we made the switch to standards and we're taking from all of these things, we realized that it actually benefits us to put it back. And one untangible benefit, when you write your projects for open source, you do it with a different mentality. You know that the whole world's gonna be seeing this, so it, it, you take craftsmanship pride when you write your code. And this is driving a cultural change at PayPal, which is something I'm personally very proud of. So, KrakenJS.com. This is uh, the story of how we change things at PayPal. If you guys are Node.js developers, give it a try. We have a lot of good examples and tutorials on the website. Uh, you have, if you have any questions, that's my Twitter handle, my email address. Feel free to reach out to me directly and I would be very happy to answer any questions on this. And check out Node Day. That's my story. Thank you.